So hi, everybody, and welcome to our, I think, first Google Hangout for the Wellness Think Tank. Um, I was a part of it last year. Uh, did a bunch of we did a bunch of research and and did a bunch of Google Hangouts then um, and this year we're we're kind of continuing forward with it and hopefully working on it and, and making it even bigger and better um, so it's been a it's a pleasure to have Gita Penza join us today for the for the Hangout so just to give a little intro on Gita she's an ENM physician since 2001 and assistant professor at Brown uh, with a particular interest in litigation litigation stress. She currently is working on the L Word podcast, where she interviews physicians who have been through litigation. Um, while she's not an attorney, she has been involved in litigation for the past 12 years or so. So it's it's great that we have her. We'll, we'll hopefully be able to discuss some things with regards to um, how being involved in litigation kind of can affect us as uh, physicians and learn from there. Gita, thanks so much. I'm so glad to be here. It's nice to meet all of you guys. Um, so just by way of introduction, I just want to say a couple of things. Um, as Matt said, I'm not a lawyer, um, but I've been involved in, in litigation for the last 12 years, and I'll tell you about that story. Um, I really came to this place uh, because having gone through the process, I realized that when I started, I didn't, when I first got named, I didn't know what to do. I, I really had no training. I, no one had talked to me about, um, you know, once you're sued, you should do X, Y, and Z. I was just completely stunned and taken aback. And I had all these emotions that I didn't know what to do with. And I felt isolated and ashamed. And I felt like I shouldn't talk to anybody about it. And I was also, you know, I felt like I was a good doctor. I just thought it wouldn't happen to me. And uh, boy, was I wrong. Um, so I want to come to talk to residents about the fact that lawsuits are a fairly predictable occupational hazard when you practice medicine. And we don't like to think of them that way. And you know, I'm sure that your attendings don't want to talk about it, but I can guarantee you that you work with attendings who have been sued um, or who might be going through the process. And we're we're very sort of, you know, in our own silos of suffering, trying not to um, upset anybody or to talk about it because we've been told not to talk about it. But that perpetuation of this this whole, you know, can't talk to anybody about it really does nothing but worsen the feeling of isolation and shame that comes with being names in a suit. And somewhere between, depending on whose numbers you use and how long you practice, two thirds to up to 90% of all doctors will be named in a lawsuit during their time that they're being that they're in practice. Um, so obviously all of these people aren't bad doctors. It is happening to the majority of us. And yet we just kind of perpetuate this, like, we don't really want to talk about it. It's, it's, it's embarrassing. And we're just going to pretend it doesn't happen. But that really kind of makes things worse for for all of us. So um, I'll tell you my story. Um, I was first named, uh, I graduated from residency in 2001. Uh, and so I was five years out when I was first named. Uh, and that was in 2006. Well, the case was 2006. I was named in early 07. Um, and then there was a, a lot of time that went by and we can talk about the mechanics of what happens during the actual process of a lawsuit. Um, and I'll preface it by saying that Rhode Island is um, one of the sort of bad climate states for, for malpractice. Um, I went to trial. Uh, I was the sole defendant. I'll say that. Uh, I was the sole defendant in a, in a pretty big money case. Uh, when we went to trial in 2011, uh, it was a 26-day trial. Um, I was on the stand for two days. Uh, it was really quite grueling. And in the end, the figure that they came up with was uh, $30 million is what they were asking for. And fortunately, I won. Um, there was a, a verdict for the defendant. And um, I would say it was uh, a Pyrrhic victory at best. I was pretty wrecked uh, by the whole process. And I was very, I didn't know if I wanted to go back to medicine. I really just, I just wanted to just walk away from everything. And it was really my chairman at the time, um, not Dr. Zink. I know that he's, he's a great guy too, but this was pre-Dr. Zink in a different group. Um, my chairman at the time had been super supportive through the whole process and uh, was, you know, basically in the courtroom every day he wasn't working, he would pull the nurses in, like they were all there for me all, I didn't want them there, but they were there. 
And he basically said at the end of it, like, now you owe me two weeks. So just come back and try for two weeks. And if you say you can't do it, that's fine. But try. And then, you know, I went back for two weeks and I was like, all right, like I can do this. But I still wasn't well. I was still burnt out and bitter. And it was sort of a long slog getting back to feeling good about what I did. But uh, here I am. So now I'm actually still in litigation for the same case. I went through the appeals process. The verdict was overturned on a technicality two years ago. And I'm returning to trial in April. Uh, we have a scheduled date for the, it was the 16th and now it's moved to the 24th. So um, going to trial the second time, and this is why I actually can't give you all, we'll say this, I'll say this later. Like you can talk about the fact that you're going to trial all till the cows come home. I just can't tell you exactly what all the facts of the case are, right? And so we'll talk about that in a little bit when lawyers say to you, you can't talk about it. They don't mean you can't say I'm getting sued and it sucks. You just can't give out the details of your case um, because, and the only reason, there's no law against that, but they will ask you, the plaintiff's attorneys will ask you, with whom have you discussed this case? And you need to be able to say, honestly, I have not discussed the details of this case with anyone except my attorney. Um, you know, peer review is excluded. Um, people sometimes talk about things hypothetically, not exactly about that case. That's, you know, you got to kind of see where you draw your line. You just have to be able to say that honestly. So um, somewhere between trial A and trial B, I kind of realized that I don't want to be that trial A person going into the second trial. And um, I decided to learn. I, I learned about it th the process the first time. Um, and just having that experience, experiential knowledge was very important. But then I decided like, you know what, I'm going to read some books. Like there's got to be some people who give good advice. And I did read one book before I went to trial the first time. And I actually have those books. I'll show them to you a little later what they are. But I did find it very helpful. Um, and I was like, I'm going to read some more books. And I'm not only that, I'm actually going to do what they say. I'm going to take advice from people. And I'm not good at taking advice from people, but I'm going to I'm going to try. Um, and I have to say, like, you know, I'm not happy that I'm going back, but I can accept that this is part of doing business. Do I feel like a little like, gosh, this has been a really unfair long road because I feel like I actually rendered this person excellent care. Yeah, I feel like that a little bit. Can I live with that? I think so. Um, I can certainly live with it. Um, does it make me feel like on certain days, like, gosh, I don't know if I can do this forever. Sure. Like I have those days. Um, but I've come back to a place where most days I'm pretty happy with what I'm doing. I've kind of made some changes in my professional career and I'm enjoying what I do now. And part of that is talking about litigation and litigation stress with residents and learners who probably don't get a whole lot about it in their um, in their training. We might give you some lectures about risk management because hospitals don't want you to get sued. But then we don't really tell you about what happens afterwards. Like when you're out there and you get sued, what do you do? Like who, who do you go to? How do you deal with it? Is it normal to feel this way? And some people, you know, in, in part of, you know, I know I, I know my story, but certainly a lot of the physicians that I've talked to during um, the course of these interviews that I've doing I've been doing or um, just in passing, if people know that you're being sued, they'll they'll volunteer to you like, oh, you know, I was sued and they tell you the story. Um, just during all of that, I realized that we all, you know, so many of us have this common shared experience that we keep to ourselves. And if we could just kind of put out there, that there are role models of resilience in this scenario, I think it would be much easier for you guys coming forward to say like, oh, like I know that doctor, she's a really good doctor and she went through this and she got sued and she's still doing this and she seems okay. Like I I could be okay. Um, I think that's really important. So I, I am sort of on this mission to get people to just open up and talk about it. It doesn't mean you were a bad doctor. It means that you were just like, 75 to 90% of other doctors out there and you got named at some point. Um, we'll talk a little bit more, you know, I, I kind of want to hear what you guys are interested in learning about. I, I think that there is uh, a lot to be said about, you know, any of the areas that I outlined the, in terms of just risk management, trying to avoid being sued. And I want to make the point that you can do all of those things and still get sued because we are not immune to bad outcomes no matter what we do. 
we can talk a little bit more about just um, what to do in the case of an adverse event, whether or not you think that you are, um, you know, whether you've made a mistake. And if you did, honestly, like, it's really not that special because we all do. Um, but there's really no great forum for us to talk about that outside of a peer review, sort of a, you know, a more punitive setting. And, and that's something that I feel like we also need to change because we all, we all do make mistakes. Um, I also think that, you know, we can talk a little bit about the mechanics of being sued about deposition and trial. Really, I, I'd like you guys to sort of lead with some questions and I'm happy to tell you anything, anything else about it, whatever, whatever you guys want to know. So let's, I'll, I'll start it off. I, I probably have a couple of questions for you, but when you initially got sued um, and you, you, you got, you've got, you got served papers in essence, did that make you uh, like, I'm trying to think what's, what's the, the question I, I really want to phrase. Did you look at it as, as like it, the official an initial shell shock where you kind of were like, why are they suing me? I'm a good doctor, or at least you think you are. And, and then did you start kind of second guessing what you did? Like, did that make you, did that put you in a position where you're like, well, what else am I doing maybe wrong? Or did I do something wrong? And um, do I now need to kind of become this ultra conservative person who really works up everything because now I have to, now maybe I'm not a good doctor. Did that, did that affect you in that sense? Absolutely. And I think that that's a very common shared experience for almost every doctor that's been sued. Now, and I'm not talking about nuisance suits where you're just like, oh my God, like that's ridiculous. Like and those those things wouldn't change your practice. But, you know, for me, this was a fairly, um, you know, this was a fairly serious case and it involved a bad outcome in a young person. And, um, and I knew there was a lot at stake. And so I, I really a thousand times backwards and forwards went over what did I do? Could I have done something different? You know, you spend a long time replaying events. If you, if you remember it now, over half of people who are named in lawsuits don't remember the case. So it's, you know, a lot of people feel blindsided um, when they're sued. So it may not be that you are waiting for the other shoe to drop. Um, but you've all probably experienced adverse events by now or just bad outcomes. And, you know, maybe they, you weren't, you were expecting things to turn out differently. And then you have, so that sort of day where you're just like, oh God, like, could I, have, what could I have done differently? Did I do everything right? Did I, you're sort of obsessively recasting all those events in your head thinking, how could this have played out differently? That happens to sort of the nth degree um, when you get handed those papers. And part of that is just this natural um, psychology of an acute psychological stressor. So there is a normal expected psychological response to an acute trauma or um, significant stressor that it would be, you know, we would be wrong not to acknowledge that is just sort of normal human behavior. So the first step, so when you have that sort of trauma there, and it's, you can almost, you know, Kubler-Ross it too, there's, there's sort of that aspect to it, but there's this first, you're, you know, in denial, like this can't possibly be happening because I am a good doctor or I did everything right. How could this happen? And then there's, while you're trying to sort of absorb and work through it, there is this whole cycle of emotions of, um, you know, that sort of imposter syndrome kind of comes through. There's um, a constant sort of background of um, intrusional thoughts where, you know, you can be working and then the thought kind of hits you like, man, like there's this case and I really messed up and I should, you know, and all of a sudden you kind of get flooded with all the same emotions that you, that you felt when you were sued, when you were named first, because that's a big rush of stuff because it kind of hits you like a ton of bricks. A lot of times you're not expecting it. In some States it's delivered by a sheriff. Um, so like when you get, yeah, when you get served, you really get served. Um, and it's really super traumatic. So those feelings will come back at times when you don't want them to come back. You could be trying to relax or just get your mind off something or you're at work or whatever. And those, there's this cycle of it just kind of keeping coming, coming. And if you, if you can't work your way out of that cycle, it can become a fairly obsessive thing and you can be, have developed some maladaptive behaviors. So it doesn't have to go that far, but it's really common to become at work more conservative. Um, I think that fairly everybody that I've talked to feels like there's a, a, there, there's a pendulum and, and you can get stuck on that far side or you can kind of come back to center a little bit as time goes by. 
But, um, you know, like in my particular case, um, again, I shouldn't really say too much about it, but there was an imaging study that, you know, they were arguing should have been ordered. Um, and I really didn't feel like it was, it was indicated. But when you're put in that position again, you feel like, gosh, maybe I should just order it to stay out of trouble. And it's not the way you want to practice, uh, but it does, it, 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 there is really no way to keep it from getting into your psyche like that. And you have to sort of work through it step by step before you can feel like you were sort of the doctor that you aspire to be again. Um, but it really does eat at you sometimes. I can't. Hear. Uh, yeah, there you go. There you uh, go. So was there, w during that initial period, is, right before, r right when you initially got served, is, was there anything that you remember doing that kind of helped you along? Like something, something that you did that either got your mind off of it or something that you did that helped you relieve some of that stress or you did that um, made you feel more normal, for, for lack of a better word? Um, you know, look, either looking back at it or maybe not then, but something that you would suggest people would, should, or could do. Yeah. So in that initial period, um, I, I'm lucky in some ways in that I'm, I'm married to a physician. So part of what I tell people now is that you really need to talk to somebody who gets it. So it's, you know, if you're, if your spouse isn't medical or, uh, or wasn't, you know, with you through your training or doesn't understand the degree of sacrifice or anything like that, that, you know, that's involved, it, they certainly should know what's happening, but they may not be the person that you really need to lean on. For me, being able to talk to my spouse, at least, you know, him, all you have to do is say to another doctor, like, I'm getting sued. And they know, they know what that means, right? You don't have to explain why it hurts so much or why you feel so strongly or why it rocks your core. You don't have to explain that to most other physicians. You just say like, I'm getting sued and I'm really having a hard time and they know. And this is one reason why I feel like we should be talking more openly about it because we should be there to support each other. The other thing that really helped me a lot um, was I mentioned my chairman before. I had somebody externally who knew the case because my group was being sued. So he is the representative of our group, like knew all the details of the case. He knew everything. And he was able to say to me, you did everything right. You know, that was super helpful. And that may not be the case for everybody, but at least someone can sort of support you and say like, you are a good doctor. Everything you did was understandable. I can see how it went this way. Just having some sort of external validation is super helpful. Um, in terms of taking care of yourself, it's hard. You can easily get lost in those first few weeks to months for some people. Um, I think you need to be aware of, of your emotions. And that's something that's kind of hard to do, but you have to, you have to name them. And you also have to, you know, educate yourself because what you want to do is you're going to be in this position where you feel like you're really helpless and you don't know what to do. And um, I'm going to give you the steps of what you really need to do. Like there is, there are actual legitimate steps you should take. So, you know, you get the envelope. The first thing you do is you call your malpractice insurance carrier, right? And you notify risk management and you talk to your insurance carrier and they will assign you someone to talk to and they are going to assign you an attorney. And that's basically all you have to remember for the first steps. If you can remember to do that and then to find yourself some sort of um, there's a bunch of them. I would, you know, I'm going to recommend some books to you, but if you could also, you know, the, you could look at ASAP has resources uh, for people who are being sued. The professional societies all have resources. You start to educate yourself on the process. This is not the time to be doing research about your case. This is not the, don't contact the plaintiff. Don't do like any kind of research about what you're, you know, what you're afraid you're being sued over what you do at that time is just learn about the process. You get resources to kind of help you through the process. I recommend now to people getting those books ahead of time, like knowing that stuff ahead of time, because knowledge is power and familiarity will make you much more comfortable. It's that fear of the unknown and feeling alone that makes this process so much heavier than it should be for us. It should not destroy us the way it routinely does. 
um, for lots of lots of people. It should should not be that way, especially when it's so common. So learn learn to read your emotions. Acknowledge if you you know need help, and find someone that you can talk to who understands what it means to be in this position. Awesome. Uh, anybody else have any particular questions or thoughts based on that or along those lines or completely separate from this, from that can't just be me. What did your hospital do to support you or your group? Okay. Um, so not a lot. <laughs> so well, at the time, so at the, I mean, I should, I should correct. At the time, I'm, I wasn't working for the same, my group was acquired by another group and, and you know, that's how sort of I wound up at Brown. Um, but I do want to make the point that you and your hospital um, may not always be on the same page as the process goes through. Now, some hospitals do have um, resources in terms of support. Uh, many risk management programs have, um, you know, if you you should probably know who your risk management person is by now, who that contact is by now, and they can certainly point you to resources in terms of talking and support. Mm, some hospitals have peer-to-peer -peer programs, which I highly recommend. We have a peer-to-peer -peer program called the Apollo Program, where physicians who have been through the process can talk to physicians who are new to the process and kind of guide them through it and just be that, you know, that shoulder that people really need. But I want to say one thing in terms of caution, that is um, you and your hospital should have separate representation. Um, you might have the same insurance carrier. You might have, you know, there might be all sorts of reasons to try and um, sort of share representation. You do everything in your power to have your own representation and, um, and don't communicate through intermediaries. You talk to your lawyer, the hospital has their lawyer, and um, because, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, you, there will be these very complicated decisions. Um, it's a very, turns into a very complicated game of chess. Um, and at times it's kind of a dirty game of chess. It's as I have, I've said to someone the other day that the most surprising thing about the process to me, oh, well, I was a lot of things I was really surprised at, but, um, but just, it's kind of, a, it's kind of dirty. And that's not, the world that we're used to living in, right? We're, we want everything out there. We deal in facts and we're always like looking to do the right thing for our patients. And we are always looking out for everybody else. This is not that world. This is a really like the, the stuff that happens is just, um, it's upsetting. It's frankly upsetting. It's just not a world that we're used to operating in. Um, so hospitals and defendants, aren't necessarily on the same page when it comes to, say, settling a case. And the actions of the hospital when they decide they want to settle because they have fiduciary responsibilities to themselves, they may feel very differently about settling than you, who has not only, you know, you, you, you might think about the financial aspect of things, but really you're kind of in it for your honor. And that's a, that's a different standpoint. And you, you may, and everybody has their own, their own criteria of like, you know, whether a settlement is offered, whether or not to go through with it, what you can take in terms of defending yourself, all that stuff. The malpractice carrier absolutely plays into that decision. Sometimes they have final say, but um, I just want to caution you on that point. Um, I, I guess I should leave it at that, but, but in, in, I don't know, like six months, I can talk about it a lot more openly. Um, but I'll just say that hospitals and, and defendants are not always on the same page. But avail yourself if they have resources for, um, for, for supporting physicians who are experiencing litigation, absolutely take advantage of those. I have a question about um, prevention. You know, like um, everybody's read the ED course and maybe some people here are doing it where it's like considered this, 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 or listed out their differentials. Does that ever help you or could that hurt you in a lawsuit? So in, in general, documentation should be your friend, okay? So <clears throat> I want to make the point that you can document everything. You can, you know, and, and have reasonable documentation, everything look great, uh, but you are still at risk if you have any sort of adverse outcome. 
where really good documentation helps you is so not, you know, it'll help you a little bit in keeping you out of it. If there's a little fishing expedition ahead of time, sometimes there's a request for records first and they just want to see what's going on. And if they present them to someone to review and they say like, oh, like, you know, you have a case here, then okay, they'll move forward. And sometimes if it's sort of like one of those iffy things and they get the, the records and they have someone review them and they say, no, this doctor was very conscientious. They did a lot of documentation. I think that they, you know, they rendered really good care. I don't think you have a case. Then they might say, okay, I guess we don't have a case. So it's always in your best interest to document well. I don't think that it's uh, any sort of guarantee that you're not going to get sued. Um, was there a second part to your question? There was. What was it? Kind of like the specifics of your ED course saying oh. like considered, you know, all these really big bad things, but you didn't order any tests for them or listing out your differentials that you thought about. Okay. So I think that it, it's helpful to, it is helpful to sort of explain your thought process. And, but then the, the, the flip side of that is you, you have to sort of explain why you did not think it was X, Y, or Z. And again, that will help you if there is sort of a fishing, because all of these cases will at some point be reviewed by, and we'll talk more about these guys too, um, by experts of some sort. Because because plaintiff's attorneys don't know medicine, most of them, right? They've, they've been around a little bit and they can kind of have a sense of, of, you know, what's egregious and what's not, but um, they really don't understand the finer points of medicine. So they rely on other people to explain that to them. So if another physician could read your stuff and say like, this person was very thoughtful, you always want to document to show how thoughtful a person you are, okay? Whether or not you are, your case is just being reviewed for that discovery phase or whether you go to trial and they're putting your gigantic, um, you know, your, your chart up on this big gigantic screen where they will hash every single word and phrase and it's unbelievable the amount of time that you will spend staring at your chart. Um, I mean, hours upon hours and days upon days, but um, they, <laughs> you know, the, the, the more you appear to be thoughtful and have considered all the, the, the options, I think in general, the better it is for you. I don't think it hurts you at all to say like, I thought about all of these things. Um, and here's why I don't think that they're necessary. I mean, in the end, you know, with someone with a retrospectoscope could say like, well, you were wrong. Like you should have thought about that. And you can say, well, at the time, what was in front of me looking at what I was seeing, it didn't seem like it was necessary because of X. And also that will help you later on, because like I said, Sometimes you won't remember, you know, in a lot of cases, people get named. You're like, I don't remember a thing about this. Um, I do know some people who document as little as possible saying that, you know, I don't want to give anybody any ammunition. I, I don't, I don't think that that's really the best course. I think that your chart should reflect that you are a thoughtful and caring physician who really thought, you know, about all of the manifestations of this case and rendered your expert opinion on what you thought was going on and then move forward from there. I think that that paints you in the best possible light. I'm looking for my mute thing. I have another one that's not exactly related to that, but like you had said, when you come back um, after you're named or whatever, and you begin, become a little more um, over-conservative or over-aggressive in your workups, is it frequent, like, do people get sued for ordering the test or for being too conservative or too aggressive in their workups? Is that like a phenomenon? Um, not yet it isn't. Uh, I think that, you know, m maybe we'll start seeing some of that now that people are kind of conscious about their, like, what they're being billed for. Um, but, but no, uh, like, you know, I, I haven't seen that. I think for the most part, um, where be, and uh, usually it's because, you know, what's the most common thing people get sued for? It's sort of delayed diagnosis or failure to diagnose, right? So that happens a lot more when you don't order a lot of tests, mm -hmm. frankly. And this is where we have a problem with defensive medicine, right? Because the, and I, I know that there have been some studies that show that, you know, suggest that maybe tort reform doesn't prevent defensive medicine. The thing is that the culture of medicine is that we don't want to miss anything. Right, whether it's not, maybe not just that we don't want to get sued, we don't want to get dragged into the process at all. Like it doesn't matter what the payout limit is at the end. Like we just don't want to be in it, and we don't want to miss anything. We want to be good doctors. We want to find what needs to be found. We want to take good care of people. Um, so there definitely is more of that that feeling like you should, like more is better. Um, and I have not seen I have not seen the the flip side of that, but maybe it's coming because you know 
people have been, there have been lawsuits now about, um, you know, overaggressive resuscitation in people who were DNR. Um, so I feel like, you know, I feel like people can sue for really anything. Um, let's just, you know, let's just make that point. I mean, and if you find a lawyer who is, and you know, there's various degrees of scrupulousness, uh, in, in every part of this business. And, um, if you can find a lawyer to take your case, you can sue for just about anything. I know that there is all this stuff about like, you know, proving negligence and proximate cause and blah, blah, blah. Um, they often find a way to sort of bend whatever facts there are to suit their purposes. So um, just be aware that I, the, the best advice I can give you is just to practice good medicine, just to be the good doctors that you always aspired to be and that you'll continue to be. If you practice good medicine, then it won't guarantee you, you won't get sued. You probably will anyway, but um, you will be okay. So, so along those lines, um, did you feel, and if so, or if not, do you, you have any comment on it? Uh, when you got sued, did you start feeling distrustful of your patients? And one, if you did, how'd you deal with it? Um, two, if you didn't, or if you can't really think of that, how the other people you've spoken to, how have they dealt with kind of now thinking of, uh, their patients out to get them or your, your you feel so distrustful of, of this rapport that you're trying to build with your patient that you kind of negate that whole process and work them up and you're like, well, I'm just gonna cover all my bases. So it, it, it's, it's more so, I, I don't wanna be, while we are skeptical of what our patients say sometimes, um, I, I would hate to be so distrustful to a point where, you know, every patient, I just don't believe what they say or uh, I take it with a grain of salt or, things of that sort. So kind of how do you, did, did you experience that? And if so, how'd you deal with it? Oh, I absolutely experienced that. And I think that's really very common. Um, and I've heard that theme from people talking to me or just there is, and it's, and it's definitely worse in the beginning. Like there's a whole, you know, if, if you're, when I talk about working through the process, there's that there's a very shared experience in the beginning among all of us. And there are varying degrees of how people work through that process. So if you, um, if you if you work through the process, you can come back to a place where, you know, you're probably still a little scarred, um, and you're not always thinking in terms of is this person going to sue me, but you can you can sort of be whole again. But it's always there in the back of your mind. Like that's not I don't think that's ever going away. Um, I would say that I spent a number of years feeling like that, and that really contributed to burnout and this whole you know, we talk about these constellation of burnout symptoms and, 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 you know, sort of seeing your patient as your adversary in some of these settings is certainly contributory to that. Um, this sense of, you know, if you, if you lose your sense of this doctor patient relationship, you, along with that, you lose a little bit of your sense of purpose. And without that sense of purpose, it becomes very difficult to you kind of continue on with the slog that we, you know, that you could look at it one way, what we do every day, day in and day out. It's a rough job. Um, if you add into that this like, gosh, like I just see every patient as this, you know, person who's out to get me, you you won't last for very long. Um, and but but I think that's kind of a normal response for a lot of people. You just have to sort of keep looking for it. So I tell people, I think one of the ways that I got better was that I made a very conscious decision to look for the good. I just, I look for the good, even in the crappiest of interactions, <laughs> like it's just, you know, where if you look at it as, you know, in my capacity as a doctor, this person has come to me for help. In what way can I help them? And you stick to that. You will come a long way in, in healing yourself through this process. You know, that's not the person who sued you. They are there presenting to you with a need. What can you do in your capacity to help them in their hour of need? And you do your best and you practice good medicine and you do it kindly and with as much goodwill as you can muster, because sometimes that's hard. Sorry, that's my dog shaking back there. <laughs> sometimes that's hard. Um, you concentrate on the good. You have to like really focus on looking for the good and you will be able to sort of bring yourself back. And not everybody, and I'm not saying that, you know, not everybody will stay. And I know people who have left. 
Um, and that's okay. If that's what you need to do to be well, then that's what you should do. But if you feel like you were put on this earth to be a doctor and that is all you've ever wanted to do, then this should not be the thing that drives you out of it. Just got to look for the good. I'm curious about um, like patient satisfaction survey comments or, um, you know, we've all heard that like if you're sitting when you're talking to the patient, they're, they view you as spending more time. And if the patient likes you or, and think you, you know, believe that you care. And like you said, like if you're kind, then um, they're less likely to sue despite any outcomes. Um, do you get your patient satisfaction survey comments and do you review those and do you let those impact you? Oh, <clears throat> I'm not a big fan of the patient survey comments. I mean, I like the good ones. Um, you know, and I definitely, you know, I, I, I do get them and, and I, um, I'm interested in what they say. And sometimes I'm like, that's just a load of baloney. And sometimes I'm like, oh, like, that's interesting that that's what they took away from this interaction. And that's not what I thought, but, um, it does play into, it does play into things because I think when, um, now families, by the way, are often the people that push people into suing. So if so, you should have a rapport with families. A lot of times they'll be like, "Oh, you should sue that doctor," um, and then they, you know, kind of think it over and they're like, "Okay, maybe you're right." So, um, you know, when a family's around, make sure that you have a rapport with the family. You keep everybody updated. You make they honestly feel like they are an integral part of that person's care. And um, and if that patient is willing for them to be there, then you make them part of of you know of of the decision making process and loop them in as much as you can. Um, again, that kind of goes along with being a good doctor and being kind and caring and thoughtful. Um, if you actually feel those things towards your patient, it's actually a lot easier um, to to portray to actually you know to portray those things. Um, and that's something that I'm continually working on as a, as an attending is just to you know this every time you go in like. I'm here to help this patient. I care about this patient. And then, you know, we're going to, let's, let's do this. Um, the other thing about having that rapport with patients um, is that you will find stuff out that sometimes will change your management, right? They might actually reveal something to you that they might not have otherwise, that they would have held back. Um, you tend to sort of, you know, every, you've had that experience by now, probably where like sort of midway through this thing, there's like this little nugget that comes out and you're like, wait a second, what? And then it kind of starts the wheels going in a different direction. You're like, oh my God, thank God, like they said that or that I picked up on that. And that is a lot more likely to happen if you spend a little time with the patient and you get information from other people and you're as thoughtful about the process as you can be. Um, and yeah, people are more likely to sue when they feel like you didn't listen to them. Right. So if they say if, you know, if they're if they're trying to tell you something and you're being dismissive or whatever, it makes people angry. And then if you add a bad outcome on top of that, um, yeah, they're they're going to want to sue because they're mad. They're not. I mean, presumably someone is, is hurt or harmed in some way. And they're also really angry. Um, and so they're coming at I, I actually have I, I, I know that feeling. I um, my elderly father, um, wound up with, um, gangrenous cholecystitis, uh, and I was up in Rhode Island and he lived down in Delaware and, um, you know, he went into the ER, he had a very early CAT scan in his course. It didn't show a whole lot, but clearly something was very wrong. And, um, to make a long story short, I, uh, flew down and I, asked to meet with a surgeon who blew me off for a long time. And I hung out for a long time waiting to talk to him all the while of my, you know, father's getting more, more and more septic. Um, when he finally came in, I actually introduced myself as a physician and he blew off every single thing I said. And I, cause I really was just like, you know, I think we need X. I think we need Y. Like clearly he's getting sicker. Nah, he's going to be fine. I think you're just being like a worried daughter. Like I, I was sort of beside myself. And in the end, he went to the OR um, when he was pretty darn sick and he had gangrenous cholecystitis and the surgeon came out to me and said, I am so surprised. And I was like, I am not. I am not surprised. And boy, am I mad. And I really thought to myself, like, you know what? Like, this might be it. Like, if he has a horrible outcome, like, I, I would sue this guy. Like, I've been screaming at him that something is happening and I am a freaking doctor. 
Um, and he's not listening to me. And uh, that is that is a really powerful feeling. So if your patients feel like that and then you have a bad outcome, you can be sure that they're going to be thinking about litigation. Um, because if I was, then, you know, I really, I, I can understand where they're coming from. So the best thing you can do is, is try to, even when people are mad at you, when you first come in the room, like they're, they're mad. They've been waiting for a long time. They've got this like chip on their shoulder and they are like ready to hurl it with you as you know, there's, there is a way to kind of finesse that situation and bring them back in because your eye is on, I have to figure out why this person's here and I have to figure out how I can help them. And to do that, I need to recenter this conversation and bring us all together so that I can be of service to you. So, and so some of that service recovery jazz is annoying, um, but there is, there is some truth to it. I think. And so I think in the meantime, like whatever feedback you get from people, I think is worth it. The other thing I would like to add is that what I tell people is that you should behave at all times as though you are being recorded because you probably are, <laughs> you know, like everyone's got a phone these days. And we know about some cases where people have said really not good things when patients had their phones on. There's the classic you know, if everyone's probably heard about that woman who was being sedated and the anesthesiologist was talking about her, like, and then that, that recording came to light. Just every time you're in a room, behave as though they've got their phone and they're recording everything you say. And um, that actually goes a long way. Anyone else? So you were speaking about some books that you that you mm -hmm. read. What if if you would pick probably of, of the books or, or reading books that you did read, is there one or two that you definitely recommend for residents? And then is there something that you would recommend as a new attending or if they're if they are different at all? Um we'll go from there. I have I have three. Okay. So um I have three and they're all sort of of different flavors. Um so I don't know, can you see it? So this is, uh, it's called When Good Doctors Get Sued. Uh, and it's by Angela Dodge and Stephen Fitzer. And um, neither of them is an MD. And Angela Dodge is a PhD and Fitzer is a JD. Um, but this, this is the book that a colleague gave me when I was being sued. And it really spoke to me. And I didn't know like thing one about what was happening or what to do. And it was a very good guide um, to sort of the nuts and bolts of the process, a little bit about the guidance and like how to behave during a deposition. This is all it was all totally foreign to me. Um, and you'll find that you need um, your attorney will also be like a very good guide through this process. They are very good at instructing you about how, you know, the nuts and bolts and how to be during deposition. They will prepare you. Um, so you have to make sure that you have an attorney you trust. And then once you have that attorney, you you trust them, you sort of, you know, use them as a resource. So, but this one I found very helpful. It's short, um, but I, I, I kind of keep it around. It actually lives, in, it lives in my nightstand. Um, so um, if I need it, I can, you know, it's like a little, a little talisman. Um, so this one is pretty practical. This is um, how to survive a medical malpractice lawsuit. This is Eileen Brenner. Um, this is also pretty short, uh, very to the point. And um, also quite helpful, it sort of glosses over, I feel like a little bit of the emotional stuff. There's a little a little bit in there about like, oh, you, you're not gonna feel so great, but um, the, you know, not doesn't go way into it. The Bible of all of this is this book, which is by Sarah Charles, um, who is a psychiatrist uh, and it's called Adverse Events, Stress and Litigation. So if you're really interested in getting into the nitty gritty of, from the psychiatrist perspective of, um, the psychological process of what happens to physicians when they're sued, that's your go-to. It's a little longer, it's a little heavy, it's a little dense, there's a lot of theory. Um, but, I, you know, I found it helpful in terms of like in an analytical way to sort of stand back and be like, oh, this is like everything I'm working through. Like, this makes sense to me. So, okay. Like, and clearly if it's written out like that, like I'm not the only one that feels like this. So um, it was very helpful to, um, to know that like, this is a normal, response to an abnormal degree of stress that we all have to sort of find our way through. And that the best way for us to do that is to talk to people who have had shared experiences or to understand um, what it is that we're going through 
Uh, and not just once, you're gonna have to do it a bunch of times um, before your whole, because this is a very long process. Um, it's not like you get named and then you kind of get over that and then you're better. This is a very long, if you're in it for the long haul, so like I'm in year 12. So not that I am an outlier, let me just say that. Like most of them are usually like three to five years um, and you're out, but it takes a long time to get out of the process. And so you you have to, you know, you kind of have to have like a long-term um, strategy. It is an, it's a chronic stressor with acute exacerbations. Um, it's almost like, almost like an illness that you have to manage. And um, you just need as many tools at your disposal and you can't expect to be over it like right away. You're gonna have to, it's a process. Um, but it's a process that you can absolutely work through and be whole again, maybe a little different, um, but whole again afterwards and, um, and still find some meaning in what you do. And I think that's important. Anybody else have any other questions? or comments or thoughts or conundrums, queries. I'm trying to find all my keywords. I'm curious how social media has impacted like litigation and then the stress of litigation. Like has it increased it or do people find support using social media? So that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, so uh, some of you may be on some of these larger um, social media groups uh, for emergency physicians, like MDocs is a big Facebook group, um, but there's certainly a lot of physician presence on Twitter um, as well. Uh, I, from my perspective, just being in the groups that I am, this is sort of my individual perspective, because I don't think there's any, there's certainly not any data. There's like a, a huge lack of data on any of this stuff. So if anybody wants to do some research, like, go for it. Someone has sort of reached out to me saying they'd like to do some qualitative. I'm really not a researcher. Like I, I, I'm a talker, but I'm not a researcher, but I'm very interested in everyone's stories. Um, but being on social media and being relatively active in social media, um, I have seen um, in the last couple of years, a lot of people post about, and that's actually how I found a lot of people to talk to me, um, to share their stories. Um, i basically put a call out in one of these social media groups and was like knocked over by the number of people who want to talk about their experiences. And to a person, every single one of them is like, I did not know what to expect. I didn't know anything about this process. I was totally lost. Um, and the, you know, there was, there are a couple of things coming out that I find are very interesting trends. So people, I think, feel comfortable once their case is over. There, are, there I've seen some posts where people are saying, like, I have to prepare for a deposition. What do I do? Or I'm getting sued and I'm really feeling really awful about it. Like, help me feel better. And there is, like, hundreds of comments that come after that. And they're all, you know, they're pretty good. I actually, you know, after, when I, when my verdict was overturned, um, I put a post out just saying like, you know what, I've been being sued for X many years and my, I, the trial was the longest and hardest experience probably of my life. And, um, I can't believe I have to go back. I feel like, you know, Katniss Everdeen in the quarter quell, like how could they possibly make her go back to the hunger games? Like that's basically what it felt like. Um, and it was interesting, like the comments were very supportive. Some of them were just like, no, you have to go back to trial. And in my head, I was like, no, I don't have to do that. And it's just it's very, you know, it's interesting, but you definitely feel that other people have this shared experience and they want to reach out and support you. And I find that, I think that's helpful. And I think it's helpful for the, the lurkers on social media to see people put their experiences out there and then to have this sort of flush, this flood of, of positive comments and supportive comments out there, people offering to talk, people offering like message me, I, I'll support you. I, I think that all of that is quite positive as long as you're smart about what you put out there, right? Unless your case is totally done, you cannot put out the details of what's going on in your case on social media. You can talk about your feelings and I encourage people to do that because sometimes you'll you'll reach out from a place where you feel like I need someone who gets it just to like tell me I'm going to be okay. And in these private groups, it's a pretty good place to do that. But 
anything in there is really it's it's still discoverable just consider it all discoverable don't put the details of your case out there in social media just look at it as a source of support um there was a post recently and actually i just interviewed um that doctor that i thought was really um very compelling um that was out there in in the um in that same facebook group and what that was, um, he was, his case was over and he was expressing like a lot of, I mean, this guy went above and beyond and, you know, talking about, he had a great rapport with the family. Um, the patient, um, who passed away, his father came back the next day to thank him and, um, just telling him like, I know that you did everything in your power. Like he really, I, you know, when I l learned all the details, I was like, oh my God, like, I think I would have, I would have missed this. Like, I can't believe you even found this. And, um, two weeks later his wife was in there getting the records and then and then he was he was sued um most of his um sort of rage was it was this is in illinois which is a particularly bad um you know very plain of friendly uh, conditions there and um you know a lot of it was just sort of this feeling of being forced to settle by these plaintiff's attorneys who make these threats of going after you for punitive damages or garnishing your wages and there are all sorts of ugly tactics that people use um and and the expert witnesses um that that and that's 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 another source there is you know i um i know of um one case in particular where it led to a suicide the the anger um against expert witnesses who are being paid exorbitant amounts of money um and sometimes or more than sometimes um are sort of cannibalistic, you know, they, they make it sound like you absolutely, you know, that the, 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 if you practice real medicine, you know, you have to remember that juries rely on these experts to, to, they don't know medicine, right? So it, it almost becomes a, who has the more reliable expert, you know, and do you, do you like this expert? Do you like that expert who can explain things more simply? Um, but these experts who review cases and say like, oh yeah, like, absolutely. This is completely negligent. Um, when, it's patently false. And, you know, anybody like without a stake in the game reviewing the case would say like, no, that's totally reasonable. I would have done the same thing or that <laughs> he did more than I would have done. Um, there is a special anger that kind of brews inside people, um, inside doctors for in that situation. And um, so um, it turned into this interesting scenario where uh, expert witnesses were being outed on social media and people were calling up their commentary. Now there's a danger in that because people, you know, they're always afraid, you know, can we sue for a libel or um, things like that. But um, now I think people are becoming more aware that after the fact you can bring to the attention of the professional societies, any egregious expert witness testimony. Um, and you can have that submitted for a review and we should probably all be doing that more. But I think that we, um, you know, one of my beefs is that we as a professional society, as professional societies should be doing more to police our own expert witnesses. Right now it's, you don't, no one gets any training on how to do it. There's no like ethics standards um, that people have to swear to uphold. Um, there's no body that reviews anybody's testimony. It's like the wild west out there. So there are some people who do proceed ethically and they, you know, they, and we need those people and there are people out there who don't, and we don't need those people and we need to be able to find them and kick them out. Um, but we don't have that system in place yet unless people actually start reporting testimony more. So that was a long winded answer to your question, but the social media thing is very interesting. <laughs> Anything else? I'm yours. So <laughs> I know we're coming up on our hour, but. So let me, I, I probably have one more question. I think unless anybody else has anything else, we can, we can wrap up from here. Um, did you feel apprehensive of telling your colleagues that you got sued? Um, did you feel like they were going to judge you or, make um think less of you did you did you kind of have that sense before you started talking like it, looking back at it probably it feels good to have that discussion with people but initially after you got served did you feel like oh crap i don't want anybody to know that i got sued i don't want somebody to think i'm a crappy doctor in essence oh absolutely and that's i think that's how most that's how a lot of people feel when they first you just you just don't you just want to keep your head down 
and pretend it didn't happen. Um, and then um, it kind of comes, you, you, you're faced with some choices. Some people never talk about it. You know, I actually know of one guy who did not even tell his wife for four years that he was being sued. Um, and which is, I would not recommend. Um, but people feel very, um, you feel ashamed. And as I said before, part of this, um, this stigma, I think is, um, because we don't talk about how common it is, right? We can't, you know, if, it, if something literally happens to all of us, like, why are we stigmatizing it? And if we can just come to a place where it becomes sort of a like, oh, yep, you know, I got sued. Uh, like, oh, yeah, this is a big case. Like, yeah, it's X, Y, Z. Um, I think that would really, I, I don't know, that's sort of a, maybe it won't ever really be like that. But um, it should be more like that. It should be more normalized uh, because it's, this, I mean, it's kind of a weird abnormal normal, but it's kind of a normal thing to happen in the course of being a physician sometime during your career. Like, this is going to happen. Um, I think that that's, it's unrealistic for me to to say that that's what I would like to see. Um, but but we have to do something because the degree to which people feel these feelings is, in, you know, in, in a lot of people so strong that it literally is capable of ruining not just their professions, but their personal lives. Um, you know, I've, I have spoken to, um, you know, the widow of a, of a physician who committed suicide. I've spoken to um, people who um, sort of openly admit that they had a death wish, that they started drinking, that they had unhealthy relationships, that they ruined their relationship, that they, um, you know, became withdrawn from their partner and felt like they couldn't talk about it. Like these things have really severe repercussions if you let them eat you up. And they will um, if you don't guard yourself against that. If you have an identity where, you know, as most of us do, there's such an, you know, we're so intertwined um, between our personal lives and our physician lives. Like there's really, for a lot of us, not any clear, distinct line because so much of our lives have been spent in the pursuit of this one thing. And it means really almost everything to us. And when it comes to someone standing from the outside, pointing a finger at you, accusing you of negligence and every other awful thing that they can think of um, to say that is your fault. Um, it's not just that it, it feels terrible. It's just, it really rattles your psyche. Um, so we have to do what we can as, you know, I, the, we certainly need to advocate. That's part of it. Um, I, we can advocate for change, but change is not coming anytime soon. So I think we're, we're all going to be practicing in the current environment for a while. Um, but we need to do what we can for each other um, because we're all kind of in this together and it's all it's happening to all of us. And so the more supportive and open we can be with each other um, when it happens, I think the better off we're all going to be. I would say one last thing um, and, and a way that I think that everybody can make things better for each other um, that there are certain ways that you can be a better colleague to someone who is being sued. So let's say you hear that someone is being sued, but it's a very like, I don't want to talk about it. Like hush, hush. Like everybody's like, you know, you don't know if they want to talk about it. Um, I would say to you that, um, it's okay to say to them, you know what? Um, I just want to say, and you don't have to talk about it right now if you don't want to, but I heard that you were getting sued and I just want you to know that whatever's going on, I think you're a really great doctor. Or I, you know, I, whatever you can say that's supportive to make that person understand, like, you know what, I have respect for you and it doesn't change because you're being sued. Um, I know you as a doctor. <clears throat> I've seen you work. Um, and, uh, you know, whatever's coming at you, I think you're better than. Um, and I'll share, I'll share one other story with you um, related to that. Um, I, when, when, during the process of when I was being sued, um, I was still in, I was still kind of in the early stages. There was a, a very high profile case in our state. Um, and I didn't know the defendant. I knew who she was. Um, actually, my husband had coached one of her kids in soccer, but she and I had never met. Um, but this was like a front page news almost everyday case because it involved the relative of a celebrity. 
and um you know the hospital was in it everybody was in it and it was literally like news vans parked outside the house like every single day this thing was in the news and i remember thinking like my god what must it be like to be this person to be this doctor right and when you sort of read the details of the case you're just like oh my god like that gonna happen to anybody um so one day i was just i read the paper and i thought you know what i'm gonna write her a letter so i I got out a piece of stationery and I just wrote her a note and I just said, you know what? I have been following this in the case. I don't know you. I know who you are by all, you know, everybody says that you're a great doctor. I'm going through this process myself. Um, I just want you to know that I I'm thinking of you. I can only imagine how hard this is. I don't know exactly what my wording was, but basically it was just some supportive stuff. And I found her address from a friend of a friend and I sent it to her and then I didn't think about it again. Um, until, uh, she showed up at my trial. And um, when we met, it was it was pretty emotional because I mean, she told me the story how and she didn't, you know, she didn't write back. She nothing, there was nothing like that. But she said that the, you know, her note arrived, my note arrived on a day when she was really feeling um, you know, at the lowest of her low points and just did not know if she could put one foot in front of the other anymore. And your mind starts to go to all sorts of really dark, terrible places when you get into that hole. And she said her husband brought her the letter and it was like this handwritten note and she opened it up and she read it and she had a good cry. And then she thought, okay, like I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna do this one more. She just came at a very good time. And um, so she came to my trial. And she just said, you know what, I heard, I, I knew you said that you were going sued. We have friends in common. They said when it was, I just wanted to be here and to tell you um, that I'm here for you. And it was, it was huge. It was really huge. I think that we don't do that enough for each other. Um, and not, not, you don't have to write a letter or whatever. Like if, I mean, certainly do if that, if that comes to you, but just saying to someone, I know this is happening to you. I want you to know that I think you're a really good doctor goes a really long way. It goes a really long way because that erosion of self-confidence is one of like the hardest parts of this. Um, and so hearing from your colleagues um, whom you respect or even, you know, even if it's an attending and you're in a resident, you're a resident, you can say like, you know what I heard, I think you're an awesome teacher and I think you're a great doctor and I wanna be just like you. Um, <laughs> I can't, I couldn't tell you how, how far that would go for someone. So, you know, so just be mindful of those things and just, you know, keep, and if you think that someone really needs help, make sure they get it because this is it can wind up being a pretty dangerous situation for some people so make sure you know you walk them to help you get them what they need because this is a situation that's fraught um with danger um for people who are at risk um and we're all kind of at risk so um we should be talking about it more so anyway i've talked all your ears off but <laughs> clearly i have a lot to say so th this is awesome i mean i, I thank you so much Gita, and thank you the rest of you guys for for joining us um, just the kind of there's you, we, we probably could spend a week just talking about the process and how to how to go from soup to nuts and how to deal with every portion of it. Um, but I think this is this is an awesome, awesome hour that we spent and getting in some insight to somebody who's actively dealing with it and getting an idea of how do we deal with it ourselves when it kind of, you know, unfortunately will inevitably be one our shoes as well. Um, and it's it's going to suck. But I think you know this is gonna this is gonna help us kind of go along the way. So you know just to touch on some of the, some of the points that I think are really important that we can take away from is you know when you do initially get sued, find someone to talk to, um, and that's huge. So if it's not your spouse, find someone who's who's a physician. You know obviously you're not talking about the details per se of the case, but find someone that you can kind of confide to and who hopefully can understand what you're going through. Um, try and learn ahead of time what this process is like so that if if and when you are involved in this process, it's not sideswiping you and you're kind of in a whirlwind. So looking at some of those books and um, I'm gonna talk to Michelle Lynn and, and a couple other people and see if there's any way we can do a, a giveaway for some of those books as well to everybody. So we'll, we'll, we'll touch base on that in a little bit. And then lastly, um, be supportive of your colleagues. You know, I, I, I can't, I, I think we've all been, even at the most basic of levels, like if you think about that intern who goosed the tube, but you know, was is a good physician, even if even at their most most basic levels, or that that intern who didn't get the central line the first time and you kind of had to take over and you're, you know, but they're still good. They're they're they're, you know, you know inherently it's just that one time, it's a it's a thing of 
hey, it just didn't work for you, but you're still a good doctor. Don't think less of yourself. It's, I think it's the same thing along this lines. If there's a colleague who's in those shoes, who, who's getting sued, try and turn to them and just remind them that they're still a good person and still a good physician. And I think lastly, the other thing is, is um, try and build that rapport with your patient and build that rapport with that patient's family. Because when you, you know, research does show when you've built that good rapport, even in some negative outcomes, they're less likely to sue you. Uh, so if you can, and, and find that, and, and if you are sued and you're trying to find that path back to um, really back to norma norm normalcy for yourself, try and find that good in every physician, in, in every patient encounter that you're involved in. Um, so I think those are some huge takeaway points that you, you guys can take away both back to your residency uh, and in the future from here. And I definitely will. Um, so, you know, thank you so much, Gita. I really appreciate your time and thank you everybody. If you have any other questions, there is that Q and a, uh, the, 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 the sued portion Q and a on the wellness think tank Slack. So please put it up there. If we didn't touch base on it, we'll go from there. Wonderful. Thank you everybody. Have a wonderful night. Reach out anytime. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody.